Hello everyone, welcome to and welcome back to Book Time with Elvis with me, Mark, and uh, this continued reading aloud of Jane Austen's uh, celebrated work, Pride and Prejudice. So let's jump right in uh, with chapter 48. The whole party were in hopes of a letter from Mr. Bennet the next morning, but the post came in without bringing a single line from him. His family knew him to be on all common occasions a most negligent and dilatory correspondent, but at such a time they had hoped for exertion. They were forced to conclude that he had no pleasing intelligence to send, but even of that they would have been glad to be certain. Mr. Gardner had waited only for the letters before he set off. When he was gone, they were certain at least of receiving constant information of what was going on, and their uncle promised at parting to prevail on Mr. Bennet to return to Longbourn as soon as he could, to the great consolation of his sister, who considered it as the only security for her husband's not being killed in a duel. Mrs. Gardner and the children were to remain in Hertfordshire a few days longer, as the former thought her presence might be serviceable to her nieces. She shared in their attendance of Mrs. Bennet, and was a great comfort to them in their hours of freedom. Their other aunt also visited them frequently, and always, as she said, with the design of cheering and heartening them up, though as she never came without reporting some fresh instance of Wickham's extravagance or irregularity, she seldom went away without leaving them more dispirited than when she found them. I wonder if she's the uh, the sister of Mrs. Bennet, then, maybe. Uh, all Meryton uh, seemed striving to blacken the man who, but for three months before, had been almost an angel of light. He was declared to be in debt to every tradesman in the place, and his intrigues, all honoured with the title of seduction, had been extended into every tradesman's family. Everybody declared that he was the wickedest young man in the world, and everybody began to find out that they had always distrusted the appearance of his goodness. Elizabeth, though she did not credit above half of what was said, believed enough to make her former assurance of her sister's ruin still more certain, and even Jane, who believed still less of it, became almost hopeless, more especially as the time was now come when, if they had gone to Scotland, which she had never before entirely despaired of, they must in all probability have gained some news of them. Mr. Gardiner left Longbourn on Sunday. On Tuesday, his wife received a letter from him. It told them that on his arrival he had immediately found out his brother and persuaded him to come to Gracechurch Street, that Mr. Bennet had been to Epsom and Clapham before his arrival, but without gaining any satisfactory information, and that he was now determined to inquire at all the principal hotels in town. As Mr. Bennet thought it possible, they might have gone to one of them on their first coming to London before they procured lodgings. Mr. Gardner himself did not expect any success from this measure, but as his brother was eager in it, he meant to assist him in pursuing it. He added that Mr. Bennet seemed wholly disinclined to present to leave London, and promised to write again very soon. It's, it's quite hard to tell who's whose brother, but I suppose he's Mr. Gardner, not Mr. Bennet, so he's Mrs. Bennet's brother for sure, uh, and they use it interchangeably, don't they? So hmm. There was also a postscript to this effect. I have written to Colonel Forster to, des to desire him to find out, if possible, from some of the young man's intimates in the regiment whether Wickham has any relations or connections who would be likely to know in what part of the town he has now concealed himself. If there were any one that could, that could apply to, with the probability of gaining such a clue as that it might be of essential consequence, at present we have nothing to guide us. Colonel Forster will, I dare say, do everything in his power to satisfy us on this head. But on second thoughts, perhaps Lizzie could tell us what relations he has now living better than any other person. Elizabeth was at no loss to understand from whence this difference for her authority proceeded, but it was not in her power to give any information of so satisfactory a nature as the compliment deserved. She had never heard of his having any relations except a father and mother, both of whom had been dead many years. It was possible, however, that some of his companions in the something shire might be able to give more information and though she was not very sanguine in expecting it, the application was something to look forward to. Every day at Longbourn was now a day of anxiety, but the most anxious part of each was when the, most, uh, the post was expected. The arrival of letters was the first grand object of every morning's impatience. Through letters, whatever of good or bad was to be told would be communicated, and every succeeding day was expected to bring some news of importance. But before they heard again from Mr. Gardiner, a letter arrived from their father from a different quarter, um, for their father, rather, a different quarter from Mr. Collins. So oh, great, just what you need at such a time. Which, as Jane had received directions to open all that came for him in his absence, she accordingly read, 
and Elizabeth, who knew what curiosities his letters always were, uh, looked over her and read it likewise. It was as follows. My dear sir, I feel myself called upon by our relationship and my situation in life to condole with you on the grievous affliction you are now suffering under, of what now suffering under, of which we were yesterday informed by a letter from Hertfordshire. Be assured, my dear sir, that Mrs. Collins and myself sincerely sympathise with you and all your respectable family in your present distress, which must be of the bitterest kind, because proceeding from a cause which no time can remove, no argument shall be wanting on my part that can alleviate so severe misfor misfortune, or that may comfort you under a circumstance that must be of all others most afflicting to a parent's mind. The death of your daughter would have been a blessing in comparison to this. Oh, jeez. And it is uh, the more to be lamented because there is reason to suppose, as my dear Charlotte informs me, that this licentiousness of behaviour in your daughter has proceeded from a faulty degree of indulgence, though at the same time for the consolation of yourself and Mrs. Bennet, I am inclined to think that her own disposition must be naturally bad, or she could not be guilty of such an enormity at such, so early an age. Howsoever this that may be, you are grievously to be pitied, in which opinion I am not only joined by Mrs. Collins, but likewise Lady Catherine and her daughter, to, to whom I have related the affair. They agree with me in apprehending uh, that this false step in one daughter will be injurious to the fortunes of all the others, for who, as Lady Catherine herself condes condescendingly says, will connect themselves with such a family. And this consideration leads me moreover to reflect that with aug augmented satisfaction on a certain event of last November, for had it been otherwise, I must have been involved in all your sorrow and disgrace. Let me advise you then, my dear sir, to console your yourself as much as possible, to throw off your unworthy child from your affection forever, and leave her to reap the fruits of her own heinous offence. I am, dear sir, etc., etc., just what you need when things are bad is a letter from Mr. Collins. Mr. Gardner did not write again until he received an answer from Colonel Forster, and then he had nothing of pleasant nature to send. It was not known that Wickham had a single relation with whom he kept up any connection, and it was certain that he had no one living. His former acquaintance had been numerous. It's funny, isn't it? Acquaintance uh, seems to be like an uncountable word. We would say acquaintances now, I think, and... They say acquaintance, meaning plural or singular, interesting, had been numerous, but since he had been in the militia, it did not appear that he was on terms of particular friendship with any of them. There was no one, therefore, who could be pointed out as likely to give any news of him, and in the wretched state of his own finances, there was a very powerful motive for secrecy, in addition to his fear of discovery by Lydia's relations, for it had just transpired that he had left gaming debts behind him to a very considerable amount. He's a cad, he really is. Colonel Forster believed that more than a thousand pounds would be necessary to clear his expenses at Brighton. He had a good deal in the town and his debts of honour. A thousand pounds, that's a huge amount of money in those days. I mean, it's bad enough now, but ugh. Uh, Mr. Gardner did not attempt to conceal these particulars from the Longbourn family. Jane heard them with horror. A gamester, she cried. This is wholly unexpected. I had not an idea of it. Mr. Gardner added in his letter that they might expect to see their father at home on the following day, which was Saturday. Rendered spiritless by the ill success of all their endeavours, he had yielded to his brother-in-law's entreaty that he would return to his family and leave it to him to do whatever occasion might suggest to be advisable for the continuing of their pursuit. When Mrs. Bennet was told of this, she did not express so much satisfaction as her children expected, considering what her anxiety for his life had been before. What? Is he coming home and without poor Lydia, she cried? Sure he will not leave London before he has found them. Who is to fight Wickham and make him marry her if he comes away? As Mrs. Gardner began to wish to be at home, uh, it was settled that she and the children should go to London at the same time that Mr. Bennet came from it. The coach therefore took them the first stage of the journey and brought its master back to Longbourn. Mrs. Gardner went away in all the perplexity about Elizabeth and her Derbyshire friend, that had attended her from the part, from that part of the world. His name had never been voluntarily mentioned before them by her niece, and the kind of half-expectations which Mrs. Gardner had formed of their being followed by a letter from him had ended in nothing. Elizabeth had received none since her return that could come from Pemberley. The present unhappy state of the family rendered any other excuse for the lowness of her spirits unnecessary. Nothing, therefore, could be fairly conjectured from that, though Elizabeth, who was by this time tolerably well acquainted with her own feelings, was perfectly aware that, had she known nothing of Darcy, she could have borne the dread 
of Lydia's infamy somewhat better, it would have spared her, she thought, one sleepless night out of two. When Mr. Bennet arrived, he had all the appearance of his usual philosophic composure. He said, as little as he had ever been in the habit of saying, made no mention of the business that had taken him away, and it was some time before his daughters had courage to speak of it. It was not till the afternoon, when he joined them at tea, that Elizabeth ventured to introduce the subject, and then, on her briefly expressing her sorrow for what he must have endured, he replied, Say nothing of that. Who should suffer but myself? It has been my own doing, and I ought to feel it. You must not be too severe upon yourself, replied Elizabeth. You may well warn me against such an evil. Human nature is so prone to fall into it. No, Lizzie, let me once in my life feel how much I have been to blame. I am not afraid of being overpowered by the impression. It will pass away soon enough. Do you suppose them to be in London? Yes, where else can they be so well concealed? And Lydia used to want to go to London, added Kitty. She's happy then, said her father dryly, and her residence there will probably be of some duration. Then, after a short silence, he continued, Lizzie, I bear you no ill will for being justified in your advice to me last May, which, considering the event, shows some greatness of mind. They were interrupted by Miss Bennet, who came to fetch her mother's tea. This is a parade, cried he, which does one good. It gives such an elegance to misfortune. Another day I will do the same. I will sit in my library, in my nightcap and powdering gown, and give as much trouble as I can, or perhaps I may defer it till Kitty runs away. I'm not going to run away, Papa, said Kitty fretfully. If I should ever go to Brighton, I would behave better than Lydia. You go to Brighton? I would not trust you so near it as Eastbourne for fifty pounds. No, Kitty, I have at least learned to be cautious, and you will feel the effects of it. Oh, poor Kitty. No officer is ever to enter my house again, nor even to pass through the village. Uh, balls will be absolutely prohibited unless you stand up with one of your sisters, and you are never to stir out of doors till you can prove that you have spent ten minutes out of every day in a rational manner. Kitty, who took all these threats in a serious light, began to cry. Well, well, said he, do not make yourself unhappy. If you are a good girl for the next ten years, I will take you to a review at the end of them. <laughs> oh, dear. Chapter 49 Two days after Mr. Bennet's return, as Jane and Elizabeth were walking together in the shrubbery behind the house, they saw the housekeeper coming towards them, and concluding that she came to call them uh, to their mother, went forward to meet her. But instead of the expected summons, when they approached her, she said to Miss Bennet, I beg your pardon, madam, for interrupting you, but I was uh, in hopes that you might have some good news from town, so I took the liberty of coming to ask you. What do you mean, Hill? We have heard nothing from town. Dear madam, cried Mrs. Hill, in great astonishment, don't you know there is an express come for, come for master from Mr. Gardiner? He has been here this half hour, and master has had a letter. Away ran the girls, too eager to get in to have time for speech. They ran through the vestibule, into the breakfast room, from thence to the library. Their father was in neither, and they were on the point of seeking him upstairs with their mother when they were met by the butler, who said, If you are looking for my master, ma'am, he is walking towards the little copse. Upon this information, they instantly passed through the hall once more and ran across the lawn after their father, who was deliberately pursuing his way towards a small wood on one side of the paddock. Jane, who was not so light, not so much in the habit of running as Elizabeth, soon lagged behind, while her sister, panting for breath, came up with him and eagerly cried out, Oh, Papa, what news, what news? Have you heard from my uncle? Yes, I've had a letter from him by express. Well, what news does it bring, good or bad? What is there of good to be expected, said he, taking the letter from his pocket, but perhaps you would like to read it. Elizabeth impatiently caught it from his hand. Jane now came up. Read it aloud, said their father, for I hardly know myself what it is about. Grace Church Street, Monday, August 2nd. My dear brother, at last I am able to send you some tidings of my niece, and such as, upon the whole, I hope will give you satisfaction. Soon after you left me on Saturday, I was fortunate enough to find out in what part of London they were. The particulars I reserve till we meet. It is enough to know they are discovered. I have seen them both. Then it is always as I hoped, cried Jane. They are married, Elizabeth read on. I have seen them both. They are not married. <laughs> uh, she's, I have to say, she's quite funny, Jane Austen, actually, the way she writes things. I, I hope it's deliberate uh, humour. It's just not me being silly. Uh, they are not married, nor can I find there was any intention of being so. But if you are willing to perform the engagements uh, which I have ventured to make on your side, I hope it will not be long before they are. All that is required of you is to assure to your daughter, by settlement, her equal share of the 
found secured among your children after the decease of yourself and my sister um, and moreover to enter into an engagement uh, oh yeah he's cleared it up then so it is I think he means yeah there is his her sister there and moreover to enter into an engagement of allowing her during your life 100 pounds per annum these are conditions which considering everything I had no hesitation in complying with as far as I thought myself privileged for you I shall send this by express that no time may be lost in bringing me your answer. You will easily comprehend from these particulars that Mr. Wickham's circumstances are not so hopeless as they are generally believed to be. The world has been deceived in that respect, and I am happy to say there will be some little money, even when all his debts are discharged, to settle on my niece, in addition to her own fortune. If, as I conclude, will be the case, you send me full powers to act in your name throughout the whole of this business, I will immediately give directions to Haggerston for preparing a proper settlement. There will not be the smallest occasion for your coming to town again. Therefore, stay quietly in Longbourn and depend on my diligence and care. Send back your answer as soon as you can and be careful to write explicitly. We have judged it best that my niece should be married from this house of which I hope you will approve. She comes to us today. I shall write again as soon as anything more is to be determined on. Is determined on. Yours, etc. E. W. Gardner. Or Edward, I suppose. Uh, is it possible, cried Elizabeth, that she had finished? Can it be possible that he will marry her? Wickham is not so undeserving, then, as we may have thought, said her sister. My dear father, I congratulate you. And have you answered the letter, said Elizabeth? No, but it must be done soon. Most earnestly did she then entreat him to lose no more time before he wrote. Oh, my dear father, she cried, come back and write immediately. Consider how important every moment is in such a case. Let me write it for you, said Jane, if you dislike the trouble yourself. I dislike it very much, he replied, but it must be done. And so saying, he turned back uh, with them and walked towards the house. And may I ask, said Elizabeth, by the terms I suppose must be complied with. Complied with? I'm only ashamed of his asking so little. And they must marry. Uh, yet? Yet he is such a man. Yes, yes, they must marry. There is nothing else to be done. But there are two things that I want very much to know. One is how much money your uncle has laid down to bring it about, and the other, how I am ever to pay him. Money? My uncle, cried Jane, what do you mean? I mean that no man in his senses would marry Lydia on so slight a temptation as one hundred a year during my life, and fifty after I am gone. That is very true, said Elizabeth, though it had not occurred to me before, his debts to be discharged and something still to remain. Oh, it must be my uncle's doings. Generous, good man. Uh, I think I know whose doings it is. And I think you guys do too, right? Our old friend, Mr. Darcy. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid he has distressed himself. A small sum could not do all this. No, said father. No, said her father. Uh, Wickham's a fool if he takes her with a farthing less than £10,000. I should be sorry to think so ill of him in the very beginning of our relationship. £10,000? Heaven forbid. How is half such a sum to be repaid? Mr. Bennett made no answer and each of them deep in thought continued silent till they reached the house. Their father then went to the library to write, and the girls walked into the breakfast room, and they were re Are they really to be married? cried Elizabeth as soon as they... And they... Oh, uh, sorry. And they are really to be married, cried Elizabeth, as soon as they were by themselves. How strange this is, and for this we are to be thankful that they should marry, small as their chance of happiness, and wretched as is, their, is his character, we are forced to rejoice, oh Lydia. I comfort myself with thinking, replied Jane, that he certainly would not marry Lydia if he had not a real regard for her. Though our kind uncle has done something towards uh, clearing him, I cannot believe that £10,000 or anything like it has been advanced. He has children of his own and may have more. How could he spare half £10,000? If we are ever, ever able to learn what Wickham's debts have been, said Elizabeth, and how much is settled on his side, on our sister, we shall exactly know what Mr. Gardiner has done for them, because Wickham has not sixpence of his own. The kindness of my uncle and aunt can never be requited. Their taking her home and affording her their personal protection and countenance is such a sacrifice to her advantage as years of gratitude cannot enough acknowledge. By this time she is actually with them. If such goodness does not make her miserable now, she will never deserve to be happy. What a meeting for her when she first sees my aunt. We must endeavour to forget all that has passed on either side, said Jane, I hope and trust they will be they will yet be happy. His consenting to marry her is a proof. I will believe that he is come 
to a right way of thinking, their mutual affection will steady them, and I flatter myself they will settle so quickly and live in so rational a manner as may in time make their past imprudence forgotten. Their conduct has been such, replied Elizabeth, as neither you nor I nor anybody can ever forget. It is useless to talk of it. It now occurred to the girls that their mother was in all likelihood perfectly ignorant of what had happened. They went to the library, therefore, and asked their father whether he would not wish them to make it known to her. He was writing, and without raising his head, coolly replied, Just as you please. May we take my uncle's letter to read to her? Take whatever you like and get away. Elizabeth took the letter from his writing table, and they went upstairs together. Mary and Kitty were both with Mrs. Bennet. One communication would therefore do for all. After a slight preparation for good news, the letter was read aloud. Mrs. Bennet could hardly contain herself. As soon as Jane had read Mr. Gardiner's hope of Lydia's being soon married, her joy burst forth. It seemed, no one seems bothered about going to the wedding, Mary, do they? Seeing their daughter marry, I suppose he's got others. And, uh, as soon as Jane had read uh, Mr. Gardiner's hope of Lydia's being soon married, her joy burst forth, and every following sentence added to its exuberance. She was now in an irritation as violent from delight as she had ever been fidgety from alarm and vexation. To know that her daughter would be married was enough. She was disturbed by no fear of her felicity, nor humbled by any remembrance of her misconduct. My dear, dear Lydia, she cried, this is, a deli this is delightful indeed. She will be married. I shall see her again. She, she will be married at sixteen. My good, kind brother, I knew how it would be. I knew he would manage everything. How I long to see her, and to see dear Wickham too. Oh, she's absolutely incorrigible. I, yeah, brother, Mrs. Bennet. But the clothes, the wedding clothes, I will write to my sister Gardiner about them directly. Lizzie, my dear, run down to your father and ask him how much we will give her. Stay, stay, I will go myself. Ring the bell, Kitty, for Hill. I will put on my things in a moment. My dear, dear Lydia, how merry we will, shall be together when we meet. Her eldest daughter endeavoured to give some relief to the violence of these transports by leading her thoughts to the obligations which Mr. Gardiner's behaviour laid them all under, for we must attribute this happy conclusion, she added, in a great measure to his kindness, we are persuaded that he has pledged himself to assist Mr. Wickham with money. Well, cried her mother, it is all very right. Who should do it but her own uncle? If he had not had a family of his own, I and my children must have had all his money, you know, and in his first time we ever had anything from him except a few presents. Well, I am so happy. In a short time I shall have a daughter married. Mrs. Wickham, how well it sounds. And she was only sixteen last June. Uh, my dear Jane, I am in such a flutter uh, that I am sure I can't write, so I will dictate and you write for me. We will settle with your father about the money afterwards, but the things should be ordered immediately. She was then proceeding to all particulars of calico, muslin and cambric, and would shortly have dictated some very plentiful orders had not Jane, though with some difficulty, persuaded her to wait till her father was at leisure to be consulted. One day's delay, she observed, would be of small importance and her mother was too happy to be quite so obstinate as usual. Other schemes, too, came into her, he her head. "'I will go to Meryton,' said she, as soon as uh, I am dressed, "'and tell the good, good news to my sister Phillips. "'And as I come back, I can call on Lady Lucas and Mrs. Long.' "'Kitty ran, ran down and order the carriage. "'An airing would do me good, a great deal of good, I am sure. "'Girls, can I do anything for you in Meryton?' "'Oh, here comes Hill. My dear Hill, have you heard the good news?' Miss Lydia is going to be married, and you shall have a bowl of punch to make merry at her wedding. Mrs. Hill began instantly to express her joy. Elizabeth received her congratulations amongst the rest, and then, sick of this folly, took refuge in her own room, and she might think with freedom. Poor Lydia's situation must at best be bad enough, but that it was no worse, she had need to be thankful. She felt it so, and though in looking forward neither... Uh, looking forward, neither rational happiness nor worldly prosperity could be justly expected for her sister. In looking back to what he, they had feared only two hours ago, she felt all the advantages of what they had gained. So we'll stop there and we'll pick up with uh, chapter 50 tomorrow. We're slowly getting there. Um, there's probably just under 100 pages of this small book left. So thank you very much, everybody, and see you then. Bye for now. Bye. Get it, get it,